cheer and to guide, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy Thank you. You may be seated for a little bit. Great is God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness gives us confidence. It gives me confidence right now. <laughs> Psalm 108 says, My heart is confident in you, O God. No wonder I can sing your praises with all my heart. Faithfulness is defined as constant true to one's word or promise. This defines our God. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. And that is in Psalm 18, verse 2. God is a firm foundation. Who but our God is a solid rock? And uh, Psalm 18:31. God has not changed in a world where everything is rapidly changing, rapidly and constantly changing. God is like a solid, unchanging rock that we can stand on. God's word is true, and we can count on it because it's based on his faithful character. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever, from Isaiah 40, verse 8. God does not make mistakes or change his mind. He's not swayed by public opinion. God is a firm foundation. God is an unfailing love. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. 2 Timothy 2.13 God's love for us is unfailing because of his faithful character. Your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. Psalm 36, 5. God is an anchor in the storm. Clouds come and go, swept along by the wind. But the Bible says we must look beyond the clouds and see how consistent the sun, stars, and the moon are. We know the sun will rise in the east and set in the west. In the same way, we can count on God to be true to his promises. When the storm clouds crowd in and doubts flood our minds, we must cling to the firm truth that God is faithful. It will be an anchor to hold us steady through the rough seas of this life. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary from Hebrews 6, verses 18 and 19. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we pray that you would open our eyes to be able to recognize how faithful you have been to us. And uh, let us never forget that. And I pray you would be with us, the remainder of this servants, and uh, be in our midst here. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. If you want to, you can stand again. You don't have to. Give us clean hands. Yes, sir. 
Father, we thank you for setting us free. We thank you for forgetting all of our failures, for all of our mess-ups. Lord, we just thank you that your grace covers us and that we can all be here as a family and we can all just be here to worship you, learn more about you. Um, Father, we just lift tonight up to you and, uh, yeah, we just give you all the honor and glory uh, for this evening, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Jeremy, it's all yours. Well, good evening. It is good to be back together again as the people of God, people that have been called by Jesus into a new kingdom. And that's you and me. So how do you know if your congregation is uh, spiritually growing? And isn't that kind of the theme for this year? How do you know if you're spiritually growing? I'd like to explore that a little bit tonight. You know, um, there's a, I'm a football fan, and there's a right team to root for, and I'm guessing uh, that most of you struggle in this area to know uh, who that might be. <clears throat> if you're an NFL, if you're a diehard NFL fan, you know that uh, I think it was last week was the, can you, does anybody know what happened last week in the NFL? I know it's the off season, but yeah, the combine, the NFL combine. And, and it's this deal where, uh, you know, all these college seniors or people that are com- coming, wanting to be drafted into the NFL, come together in Indianapolis and NFL teams all come so they don't have to travel everywhere. And they run all these special tests, figuring out how high these guys can jump and how fast they can run the 40 and how fast they can get around a set of cones, and how well they catch the ball, how well they throw the ball. And they run all of these simulated tests, and then they ask them all kinds of crazy questions, and do weird interviews, and they run them through, you know, just this whole thing to try to figure out who these guys are. Because, you know, these these are multi-million dollar investments that they're making, and so they want to get this right. And they're trying to evaluate absolutely everything. But here's the funny thing in this, what they call the NFL combine. The funny thing is, with all the tests that they run, these tests can't actually tell the NFL teams if they're looking at a young man who even knows how to play football. In fact, the best NFL teams know that the combine's only a tool that should be used to confirm or caution what the teams have seen on tape actually watching them play football. Right, so the test isn't necessarily all that effective. I mean, it's, it help, it's helpful, but it's not the thing that's going to tell you if you're making a good investment. Well, anyway, enough about football. It's been my experience as a pastor and a follower of Jesus that we frequently gauge spiritual growth or our level of connection with God using incomplete tests. Right? So when someone asks you, hey, how's your walk with Jesus going? Or how's your walk with God? If you're like me, you might start working down a little checklist. Okay, well, I haven't missed any of my planned Bible reading, but I didn't spend as much time praying as I thought I should. Or maybe I... You know, I, I fast one day a week, but, and I was going to do that, and I'll get back on track because I wasn't doing that. Or maybe for some of you, it means you run through the checklist of stuff that you don't want to do anymore. Well, I managed not to drink as much as I did, you know, last week, or I cursed less than I did a month ago, or I went on a mission trip last week, so that really gives you a bump in your spiritual, you know, uh, test. And we tend to have all these Christian measurables, but they're a little bit like the NFL Combine in that... They can be helpful, but they don't really get at the core of our connection with our Father. So if you would, tonight, turn with me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. In this portion of Scripture, Jesus has just informed His disciples that He's getting ready to die and He's going to be leaving them, which was not the news they wanted to hear. And Jesus is giving them his last teaching. 
right? So this is the really important stuff. If you're on your deathbed and you've got your family gathered around you and you want to say the things that are most important to you, I mean, that's the time to say them. And this is Jesus. He knows he's going to die. And so he's gathered the disciples around him and he's telling them the core stuff. I mean, the stuff he does not want them to miss. And so as we read the first nine verses, uh, look at the, I mean, we'll read more than the first nine verses, but right now let's read the first nine verses and uh, trying to see what Jesus is saying about spiritual growth and about our spiritual growth. So here they are, chapter 15. Here we go. He says this, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches." If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. We seem to be stuck. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. Let's put a few pieces together here. Fruit ought to be the product of our faith. Our walk with Jesus, our connection with Jesus. Jesus says here that if we're connected with him, fruit should be the result. And not only that, verse 2 seems to indicate that those who are bearing fruit, that this is not the fun part, those who are bearing fruit will be pruned so that they can bear more fruit. And those who don't bear fruit, that's even less fun, are cut off from the vine entirely. So Jesus expects there to be evidence of our connection with him. And more than that, he will work in your life and in my life to increase the evidence of our connection with him. And this is what we call spiritual growth resulting from a deeper connection with Jesus. So the first question I have for us this evening is, what is the secret to growth? Verse 4 says... That we are to remain in him. That's the secret to growth. That sounds a little vague though. Imagine if you're reading these verses for the first time. Maybe you're not even a Christian and you read this verse and you think, well, wait a minute. What does that mean, remain in Jesus? Does this mean I just need to keep having faith that Jesus exists? Or does this mean that I sort of hang out permanently at church so I remain with Jesus? Or what does it mean to remain with Jesus? Well, some of us who've walked with Jesus for a while automatically start attaching stuff like, well, make sure to keep praying, make sure you're in the Word, to remain in Him, stay aware of His presence. And others of you are thinking, well, quit sinning, quit making stupid decisions. I bet that's what it means to grow, to remain in Him. So if you're new to the faith, these verses should maybe even confuse you. And if you've walked with Jesus for a while, there are a lot of assumptions that can kind of start sneaking into our lives when we're reading these verses. But at this point, all we know is that to grow and to produce as a follower of Jesus is to remain in Jesus, whatever that means. Let's continue to read verses 10 and 11. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Now, you might have been expecting a laundry list of commands if this passage was brand new to you. 
Jesus gave one command. The command at the heart of everything he taught. So how do we grow? We remain in Jesus. How do we remain in Jesus? We obey him. Furthermore, Jesus says that when we do this, we find joy, which is good news. And the secret to perpetual deep happiness and satisfaction in life is obedience in Christ. But we're still left with the question, what does it mean to obey? So what does it mean to be obedient? Let's look at verse 12. My command is this love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you your friends for everything I learned from my father I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last then the, father's, then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Verse 17, this is my command. Love one another. Here's the deal. The degree to which we love others is a direct reflection of our spiritual vitality. Right, so when I ask you, hey, how are you doing in your spiritual life? And you start thinking, man, did I pray? Well, have I done my, de- yeah, do I regularly do my devotions? Do I, you know, do I uh, come to church enough? Do I, you know, you know, am I religious enough? You know, we talked about that this morning. But Jesus, Jesus says, <laughs> at the end of the day, this is my commandment. Love each other. Or let's say it like this. Our love for each other is one of the primary measuring sticks of spiritual growth and depth of connection with the Father. When we evaluate our lives and our walk with Christ, the underlying question in our lives ought to be, am I growing in love? Am I producing that kind of fruit? This doesn't mean that we don't concern ourselves with the disciplines of prayer and reading God's word and fasting, but those are not the fundamental tools for determining if we're producing fruit. Praying more to prove your devotion misses the point. Furthermore, I think we would pray more if we first loved more. Now, that sounds crazy, doesn't it? But notice verse 16. Check this out. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit will that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. You did not choose me. I chose you to bear fruit. You come into me and then... I will give you more. A vital prayer life actually appears to be a product of bearing fruit, growing in love. Remember the admonition that Peter gives to husbands in the same way you husbands must give honor to your wives, treat her as you should so that your prayers won't be hindered. In other words, love and then, man, you can pray with authority. There's something about our ability to love others that affects our prayer lives. Now that we know what fruit actually looks like, the first question for us this evening is this, are we producing fruit? Are we loving people more today than we did a year ago? Now there's a question for spiritual vitality. Are you loving people more today than you did a year ago? That's the evidence of real spiritual growth. Jesus was asked what the great, greatest commandment is. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. So in that answer, Jesus understood God's the source. He's the vine. But the fruit that's produced always looks like love for other people. Spiritual growth is a product of our love for each other. It's the evidence of our love for each other. And the second implication 
I see from Jesus' teaching in John chapter 15 is that God will cause an increase in growth in those who are growing. Those who are producing, God is going to prune in order to produce more. Or maybe I should say it like this. Those who are loving others, God is going to equip you to love others better. And God does his equipping and pruning in many different ways. Situations drop into your lap. A friend gets cancer. Our selfishness gets cut away as we learn to love somebody who isn't able to love us back very much. I just want to share some stories about uh, how I saw this work. You know, I pastored for 12 years uh, at Mennonite Christian Assembly, so I, I saw a lot of stuff. At the church I pastored, uh, there was a couple who became very close to Sarah and I. They were actually our parents' age. But they loved us, and they cared for us, as they did everyone else. It wasn't just us. They loved other people with an uncommon love. Uh, They had hurting women who maybe were in abusive relationships come and stay at their house. They mentored a young man who couldn't seem to get his act together. They hired drunks and druggies into their business and gave them a shot at sobriety. They cared for people in a way that was just uncommon. Well, what you need to know about this couple is that prior to our arrival at the church, their marriage nearly collapsed. Uh, The husband, uh, a number of years before we came, had had a complete mental breakdown. Uh, He was in and out of hospitals, looking for hope. Uh, He did some really bizarre treatments because he was so desperate. Uh, And he was lethargic. He wouldn't communicate. He wouldn't get out of bed. All he wanted to do was die, and this went on for seven years. In fact, his wife had come to the elders at one point and said, can I divorce my husband? I can't live like this anymore. Now, here's also what you need to know. They were pillars in the community. And they were suffering this complete breakdown. And in their eyes, this complete humiliation. There didn't seem to be any hope of the nightmare ever ending. Their children had to run the businesses that their dad used to run. And the once optimistic and joyful dad, as I mentioned, lived a depressed, tired, non-communicating life. Finally, after many years, uh, he slowly began to make a turn. And this was slow and gradual. And everyone actually would still say to this day that he isn't who he used to be. But here's the truth, none of us are. But people do know this about this couple. If you wanted to be loved in our church, you knew exactly where to find it. Truth is that God doesn't waste our wounds. He doesn't waste our pain. We may never feel whole after a severe hurt. But God has a way of using our painful areas to draw others in. I'm going to tell you another story. I had a close friend who was an elder in our church. And he and his wife had three children. Uh, Two of them had grown up and gotten out of the house. Is this me? Tell you what, what if I just turn this off and use this? Is that okay? Uh, He he ran a large uh, and successful uh, business. He gave away millions to the work of the kingdom. And a number of years ago, he discovered that he had a brain tumor. And they spent the next number of months traveling the world, doing experimental uh, treatments. We laid hands on him, anointed him with oil. And uh, nothing seemed to cure his disease. And in about six months' time, he was gone. Gone. His wife would tell me that after he died, she would spend her nights in their closet just weeping, 
wondering how life could go on for her. Several years ago, she came to me and she said, she said Jeremy, I, uh, I want to start a care group for widows and widowers. And so out of her pain, she, uh, seeks, she seeks out others who've experienced the loss of a spouse and looks to offer them support and comfort. You've probably seen this, people who've experienced trauma and managed to cling to their faith or find faith. There's something special in their spirit. I see this in my wife. My wife's father uh, committed suicide when she was 14. And the tenderness that Jesus has given her toward others is one of the things I find most beautiful about Sarah. Now, you may be wondering, so, uh, Jeremy, <laughs> do I have to nearly die? Or does somebody near to me have to die for me to be pruned in such a way that I love people with an uncommon grace? Is that, is that how this works? Well, yeah, sort of. But not necessarily like that. You see, to really love, you do have to give up yourself. Part of the beauty of the church is that you're stuck with a bunch of idiots. You know that? That's actually a gift. Jesus is inviting you to value them, even when they're absolutely insane. You see, that requires some death. In the church that I pastored, is this being recorded? Uh, in the church that I pastored, we had a, we had a mentally uh, challenged man, and he had married an equally mentally challenged wife, and uh, they were so disruptive. Uh, I'd be preaching, or they could be, and uh, they'd be sitting about up here. Is that, is that you guys? I'm, I'm not talking about you, but... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, I'd be preaching, and sometimes, you know, the wife, uh, she didn't know quite what I was saying, and her husband was actually challenged in such a way that he was, he was absolutely brilliant, so brilliant that uh, there's just no social recognition. And so uh, she'd ask the question while I was preaching, and so he'd answer the question. And I could hear this conversation going on, and everybody within about 25 feet could hear this conversation going on. And that just takes a special grace for everybody in their vicinity. You know, it's disruptive. It was maddening to some, actually. But you know what else it was? An opportunity to love. We had this lady uh, in our church who also would come to me periodically and complain about the cleanliness of our church building in rather passive-aggressive ways. We had another church member who uh, you could not get away from after she had trapped you in the lobby. <laughs> and uh, so I will confess to some mornings being on the lookout. <laughs> we had a very angry old man who once was so peeved at something an associate pastor said that he came to me out in the lobby in very loud and uncertain terms, told me after church that that pastor was never to be in the pulpit again. By the way, I loved our congregation, and we cried last summer when we had to leave. We were family. And one of the things, and one of the ways that we're pruned... One of the ways we learn to love sacrificially is by learning to love the, uh, well, how shall we say it, the special people in our family. Where do your best crops grow around here? Do they grow up on top of the mountain over there or down here in the valley? You know, the view is awfully great up there. The view is really nice on the spiritual highs. But if you want to produce anything, that happens in the valley. 
Your difficulties are the door through which we learn to love. If you find yourself refusing to be around people who aren't like you or aren't in your stage of life or you find yourself incapable of seeing pain in others, the stuff that they're living out, you may need a heart check. In fact, it may be that the love of God isn't even in you and that's a terrifying thought. As a church and as individuals who make up that church, the measure of your spiritual health is actually your capacity to love others, to care for each other and others in your communities. You see, the early church understood this as well as any church in all of history. Justin Martyr, an early Christian historian, described love in the early church this way. He wrote this about the early church. He said, We who used to value the acquisition of wealth and possessions more than anything else now bring what we have to the common fund and share it with anyone who needs it. We used to hate and destroy one another and refuse to associate with people of another race or another country. Now, because of Christ, we live together with such people And pray for our enemies. You see, in the early church, when a devastating plague swept across the ancient world in the third century, Christians were the only ones who cared for the sick. When they did, which they did at the risk of contracting the plague themselves. Meanwhile, the pagans, they were throwing their infected members of their own families into the streets. Even before they died, if, 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 uh, they would just take their people who were sick and put them out in the street because they didn't want them close to them in order to protect themselves from the diseases. And instead of doing that, the Christians would come along and gather up these six people and take them back to the houses and care for them. And many, many, many Christians died because of it. But the love of Christ was so deeply ingrained in them, they gave up their lives for many of these people they didn't even know. It is impossible to love God and not love his people. I don't know this area very well. It's only perhaps my third time uh, in this valley. But if my guess is right, some of you tonight are probably struggling with the church. Asking yourself, well, how can I love a group of people with these kinds of issues? And I did not talk to Sherman about whatever issues you might or might not have. Some of you have even been hurt tremendously. And my heart hurts for you. Those wounds are not fun. But I invite you to do the things that make for love. Come back to a Savior who first loved you. Practice forgiveness, kindness, patience. 1 John chapter 3, 14 says this. We know that we have passed from death to life. Because what? We love our brothers. And anyone who does not love remains in death. So this evening I want to ask you. In light of the scriptures we've read tonight, how are you doing in your walk with Jesus? Is the fruit of your life characterized by your love for others? Are there poor relationships in your life that you've made excuses for? When we talk about healthy churches and healthy spiritual growth in the church... We have to talk about how we interact together as a church family. We can't escape it. God will use AMC to humble you. He will. To frustrate you. He will. Not because the church is evil. But because it's family And it's a broken family that's being healed. And in those kinds of family relationships, pain inevitably happens. You all fought with your brothers and sisters growing up. At least I suspect you did.
And if you understand that to be that kind of pruning that Jesus is giving, to cause us to become more merciful, to cause us to become more gracious, more kind, to help us see others with his eyes, something beautiful will be happening in your lives. I'd like to pray this evening in closing. And I wasn't sure uh, coming into the night how I wanted to wrap things up. Sherman just said, well, do whatever you need to do. <clears throat> Loving other people can be very hard. And uh, tonight... As we close, uh, I want to just give you an opportunity uh, to tell the Lord if you've been prompted and uh, you know in your heart that there is somebody you're struggling with and you want to offer that to God and ask for his spirit's help in learning to love that person. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to come forward, but I am going to ask in a moment as we stand for you to raise your hand. And then I want to pray for you as a congregation. And, uh, and then I'm going to invite you to pray for uh, the people that come to your mind that you're struggling with in particular. Can we do that? So why don't we stand in closing this evening? And let's pray together. Father, we are... Uh, so grateful for your love for us. So grateful that you've caused, called us into a family. You've given us homes in your family. When we were orphaned children. Unaware of your love. Unaware of how to deal with the darkness in our lives. Thanks for taking us in. God, we confess that living in your family is difficult sometimes. We're a bunch of broken children being healed, but we still have brokenness. And so uh, tonight, we ask for your help. Just as we have our heads bowed and eyes closed, uh, if there's somebody that the Holy Spirit has put on your heart tonight as we've read the scriptures I just invite you to raise your hand in acknowledgement of that All right, Lord I pray for those whose hands have been raised in acknowledgement of that God would you empower them to do the thing that makes for love I pray that you'd open up their eyes to the pain of the individual that is difficult to love. Would you open up their hearts to mercy? And would you open up their minds to knowing how to love in difficult situations? And now I invite you to spend a moment or two praying for those people that have come to your mind. And I want to ask <clears throat> all of us uh, to, to pray a prayer of blessing. If you raised your hand, would you pray a prayer of blessing over the person that came to your mind? And for the rest of us, let's take a moment and pray a prayer of blessing 
uh, over someone that, that the Lord brings to mind in the next few moments. Let's just do that together quietly. Father, tonight, my prayer would be that Allensville Mennonite Church would be a beacon of love in this valley. That they would be known for their love for each other and for their love for this community. We ask these things in the name of Jesus for your glory and for our joy. Amen. In the next two evenings, uh, we want to continue to talk about the church, and I want to think about our greatest challenge and our greatest opportunity as a church. So we look forward to seeing you uh, tomorrow night. May you go in peace with the grace of Jesus. You're dismissed.